So we will now move to the MPI. I inform the Senate that at 8.30 a.m. today, 36 proposals were received in accordance with Standing Order 75. The question of which proposal would be submitted to the Senate was determined by lot. As a result, I inform the Senate that the letter from Senator Chandler proposing a matter of public importance was chosen. It is shown at item 13 on today's order of business. Is the proposal supported? Thank you, Senators. I understand that informal arrangements have been made to allocate specific times to each of the speakers for today's discussions. With the concurrence of the Senate, I shall ask the clerks to set the clock accordingly, and I call Senator Chandler. Thank you, Madam President. I am pleased to speak on this matter of public importance on the topic of health, which is consistently the top priority for Australians and Tasmanians when it comes to the delivery of government services. In rural and regional areas around Australia, particularly in my state of Tasmania, one of the constant challenges for small communities is their ability to uh, attract and retain general practitioners. We see this problem regularly affecting communities, particularly in the electorate of Lyons. Communities like Ooze, which has been desperately trying to find GP providers to deliver primary care to that community. And indeed, we see the same problem occur regularly around Lyons when a GP in a local practice retires or moves on. When you speak to residents, medical practices and councils in any part of Lyons, whether it's Deloraine or New Norfolk, Brighton, Oatlands, the Tasman Peninsula, this is raised as a concern more often than any other topic. Communities right across Tasmania have experienced the difficulty in finding GPs to live and work in their communities. And of course, in regional areas, there is often an older and less mobile population who can't simply get in the car and drive to Hobart or drive to Launceston every time they need to see a doctor. They want to be able to have that service more closer to home. This is a long-standing challenge, Madam President, and there are no simple solutions. We all understand that in this place. But in the context of that challenge for regional Tasmania, it was disappointing that the government's main election tactic in Lyons was to spread misinformation about pensioners being forced onto the cashless debit card, misinformation that they continue to spread even after independent fact checks declared it false during the election campaign. And when it came to specific health policies, they flew down to Tasmania, re-announced the failed Kevin Rudd GP super clinic policy only for major cities, jumped on the plane and left again. The Australian Medical Association had a particularly interesting reaction to this GP super clinic policy at the time, and I do want to quote the AMA president. These centres will do little to relieve the hospital logjam, will further fragment care and will unfairly compete with general practices nearby, which, without this government funding, will not be able to keep their doors open after hours. The president went further. The plan acknowledges costs faced by general practices in opening after hours, but instead of enabling thousands of practices across the country to improve their offering to patients, it focuses on only 50 practices, using a model reminiscent of the failed Rudd-era GP super clinics. So this government policy will unfairly compete with the very general practices which are already having difficulties recruiting and retaining doctors in our regional and rural areas. And instead of recognising the great need in those areas of Tasmania, those areas in our regions, the super clinics are to be located only in Hobart, Launceston and Burnie. The recent decision of the Albanese government to include urban areas in the distribution priority model further exacerbates the difficulty in attracting doctors to rural parts of Tasmania. We now have a situation where incentives designed to attract GPs to move to rural and regional areas can now be used for GPs in urban areas, like Sydney. Medical practices and organisations in Tasmania have made it clear that if GPs have a choice between living in a state capital or moving to regional Tasmania, where they are desperately needed by those communities, then the likely outcome is that doctors will choose the capital city and it will be regional residents that miss out. If GPs who previously had an incentive to work in rural and regional parts of Tasmania can now get the same incentive 
for working in an urban area like Sydney or Brisbane, then that doesn't help. It doesn't fix the rural workforce issues. It just makes it worse. There is clearly no plan from the Labor government for rural and regional health workforces. They made plenty of noise during the campaign about their party being more focused on health. But just like their commitments that they'd reduce the cost of living and power prices for Australians, as soon as they get into government, well, we're all starting to find out, Madam President, that those promises were completely hollow and those promises were completely meaningless. Thank you, Senator Chander. Senator Green. Oh, thank you, Madam President. And I'm very pleased to speak on this incredibly important issue. And I don't know if Senator Chandler is a fan of RuPaul's Drag Race. It doesn't really seem like her kind of show. But there's a saying on that show that I want to repeat right now. The cheek, the nerve, the gall, the audacity and the gumption. How dare those opposite come in here and talk about the GP crisis? How dare they come in here and talk about primary health care? How dare they come in here and lecture this government about how hard it is for people to see a GP in rural and regional areas? Because we know, after nine years of neglect, they created this problem, they made it worse, they refused to acknowledge it and they refused to do anything about it. It is absolutely disgraceful that they are now standing here and demanding plans, talking about action, when they did absolutely nothing for nine years. This government cares about people in rural and regional areas, and we care deeply, deeply about fixing the GP crisis. And I can tell you that uh, in my conversations um, with people in regional Queensland, it is well known, very well known, that people in Emerald have to wait 12 weeks to see a GP under the, under the former government. That means there are people right now who made an appointment when the last government was in power, who are still waiting right now to get that appointment. The Labor government's been in power for 10 weeks. People in Emerald have to wait 12 weeks to see a GP. But when they were in government, the former government, they refused to do anything about this. What they did do was they cut Medicare, they froze the Medicare rebate, they drove primary health care into the ground, they refused to acknowledge that this was even an issue. When we moved a Senate motion to establish an inquiry to look into this issue, they voted against it. This is an issue that has been created by the former government, and it is an issue that the Labor government will fix. It is an issue that the Labor government cares deeply about and has a plan to fix. But it is absolutely appalling for those opposite to come in here and talk about this issue. And I thank, I thank Senator Chandler for raising it. I can't think of another MPI that's more like a Dorothy Dixer ever, ever being received by the floor of this chamber. We've been meeting with doctors and practice managers all across the country and admin staff who are answering phones, and they tell us that they are incredibly hard working and they are just overwhelmed. That is the situation that was left behind. In these conversations that I have had with these people working in the industry, I can tell that they are desperate, and I know the community is absolutely desperate. When you can't see a GP, where do you go? You end up in an emergency department at your local hospital, and we saw this time and time again through the COVID crisis, a complete denial from those opposite that, that the um, lack of GP access had anything to do with emergency departments being full. They refused to even acknowledge that it was an issue. The former government failed to improve the dire situation facing rural and regional areas. In fact, they contributed to actually making it worse. The lack of doctors and other medical professionals in, this, in these communities across Australia is not a new problem. It has been around for a very long time, and a series of government decisions by the former government during the pandemic meant that we had a spotlight put on this issue. Thank goodness, finally. But people were left with no healthcare options in their community. We wanted to see practical, positive solutions on the table to make sure Australians have access to quality healthcare regardless of where they live. And we were noisy during the campaign and we were noisy in opposition because we know that this government refused to acknowledge that there was even a crisis on their hands. This side of the chamber believes that if you have a Medicare card, you should be able to use it. 
but that is not the present situation for people living in rural and regional areas. I want to acknowledge that many people, individual residents, GPs, peak bodies, academics and others who took time to engage with the Senate committee process, whether it be through a written submission or providing evidence at a public hearing, we heard your call. We listened. The Labor senators on that committee listened to the evidence that was being given. And here is what our government will do. I can assure you, I can assure the Senate that the Albanese government is committed to investing in general practice and strengthening Medicare with almost a $1 billion investment. Our Strengthening Medicare Task Force will identify the best ways to boost affordability, improve access and deliver better support for patients with ongoing and chronic illness, backed by $750 million in the Strengthening Medicare Fund. We made this commitment before the election and we've moved quickly. The Minister for Health has already appointed members to the task force and they are getting straight to work. We are working with the experts. We are making sure that the experts are around the table and we are taking their advice. We are listening, something that those opposite failed to do. The task force brings together Australia's health policy leaders, health professionals and includes consumer, rural and regional and importantly, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander representatives. On top of that, we're working tirelessly to ensure that doctors have the resources to invest in their GP practices. We're making sure that $220 million of the Strengthening Medicare GP Grants Program is available to GPs to invest in their businesses. We're also investing $146 million to attract and retain more healthcare workers to rural and regional Australia through improving training and incentive programs and supporting developing innovative models of multi multiply disciplinary care. And our 50 Medicare urgent clinics across the country will be bulked billed and take pressure off the hospital system. And those opposite can trot out whatever quotes they want from anybody but you know what really matters? This is a policy that people in rural and regional Australia voted for. They care about these clinics. They want these clinics in their community. Because when you have a sick child, when you have a sick baby, and the only place that you can take that child is to an emergency department, well, that is an indication that the primary health care system is not working. And it wasn't working under the previous government. This is an incredibly serious issue, and it's why we are taking it so seriously. It's why we are investing in our healthcare system. It's also why we have made sure that there's a distribution priority area classification system to recognise 700 areas that either, either full or partial DPA classification is required for. We have not wasted any time, Madam President. Our government has moved quickly and decisively when it comes to improving this crisis. We have been listening to Australians, something that the opposite stopped doing years ago. We know that it is hard to see a GP. We know the cost of medicines have been high, which is why healthcare is high on our agenda. We will reduce the cost of medicines to improve cost of living, make it easier for people to access medicines under our government. Finally, can I say, on a local level in my hometown of Cairns, we are investing in uh, rural GP uh, places at the J James Cook University. We know that this is a problem that cannot be fixed overnight, but if you train local doctors in rural and regional areas, something the former government refused to do, then we can make sure that we have a generation of doctors who stay in the regions because they've been trained in the regions. This is a commitment that we made on a local level, but it shows that this government is planning on doing the hard work, the hard long-term work, to fix this issue. I have to say, coming back to the mover of this MPI, never ever in my life have I seen the most hypocrisy than this MPI, moved by a government that refused to do anything when it came to rural and regional GPs access, who voted against the Senate inquiry, who cut <coughs> Medicare telehealth appointments, cut them so that people in rural and regional areas could not access telehealth, froze the Medicare rebate, drove primary health care into the ground, and even refused to acknowledge that this was a crisis because they voted against a Senate inquiry seeking to look into this issue. The evidence 
of what the former government did is on the table, and the plans from the Albanese Labor government are clear. It is what the people in Australia voted for. It was the thing that got people to change their mind. It was the thing that made them change the government, because they know well, I take that interjection. If you've been sitting here during my contribution, you can look it back up on Hansard if you like. But I can tell you that we're doing more than your government ever did. We're acknowledging that there's an issue. We're investing in strengthening Medicare. We're making sure that GPs have access to funding. And we are making sure that if you have a Medicare card under an Anthony Albanese Labor government, you can actually use it. Because for nine years, people in rural and regional areas have not been able to do that. Thank you, Senator. Your time has expired. Senator Rice. Thanks, Acting Deputy President. There is no doubt that the shortage of healthcare workers, including GPs, in rural and regional Australia is at absolutely crisis point. We have got a massive problem, which is absolutely a sign of failure of the previous government. The previous government have <coughs> led to a situation where the crisis point is so obvious. Anybody in rural and regional Australia that talks to you about access to GPs, access to healthcare practitioners, will tell you that it is hugely, hugely a problem. The question that I find really juicy that we need to be talking about today is what we do about it. What are going to be the measures put in place by this new government to actually seriously address that problem? I chaired the Senate inquiry of the Community Affairs References Committee into the provision of general practitioners in outer metropolitan, rural and regional Australia, and we travelled quite widely across regional Australia. And I'm hoping that that inquiry will be re-referred to the Community Affairs Committee so that we can continue our investigations. It was eye-opening during these hearings to hear countless health practitioners share their concerns about the lack of access to timely and affordable health care, particularly GPs in the bush, and to hear the consequences on people's health. Um, one doctor from coastal New South Wales told us that we're at breaking point trying to service the needs of our community with a depleting number of very tired and very stressed doctors. We've got doctors in rural areas working 80 or more hours a week. We have got people waiting for weeks to see their GPs. And then you've got allied health practitioners who people not able you know, just zero accessibility for allied health practitioners. We've got a massive problem. I mean, the recommendations from our committee were that we recommended that the government um, investigate substantially increasing the Medicare rebates for all levels of general practice consultations, as well, as well as other general practice funding options, and that we review the primary care components of the medical education curriculum with a view to ensuring that general practice is a core component of the, of the curriculum. These were consensus recommendations of this committee. But fundamentally, what we need to be doing is to be properly funding and properly supporting health care across the board. And that means actually putting the money into health care, and it means doing things like putting dental care and mental care into Medicare. And it means actually spending the money, and it means raising the money. It means actually saying, yes, we should have a corporate super, super profits tax. We should have a tax on billionaires. We should scrap the stage three tax cuts, which are going to cost the budget bottom line over $200 billion over the next 10 years, and put that money into services such as health care and education, income support, the services that the people of Australia Senator really Rice, need. Senator time has expired. Senator Ruskin. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy Chair. Um, I rise today, um, first of all, to acknowledge the extraordinary effort of our medical workforce, um, particularly over the last two and a half years, as they have single-handedly battled the frontline response to the COVID pandemic. And there is nowhere where these particular health workers have worked harder, longer, more diligently than in rural, regional and particularly remote Australia. And I think all Australians owe a huge debt of gratitude to all of our healthcare workers across the whole country. And uh, I would like to add the weight of um, our parties um, of the coalition to the amazing efforts and thank them very much for what they did on behalf of all Australians. Um, but you know, the opposition absolutely acknowledges um, that there are huge challenges out there at the moment in our health workforce, exacerbated significantly by the challenges that have been put forward by COVID, but because of the changing nature and landscape of rural and regional Australia. 
Um, and that's why um, in government we invested very, very heavily um, in making sure that we started to put in place the things that needed to be done to make sure that we could continue the rebuild on a strong rural, regional and remote workforce. Um, and we acknowledge that there's still a long way to go, and we hope that those opposite that are now in government will continue to make sure that they prioritise rural, regional and remote health um, as one of the priorities of the new government, because it was something that we prioritised as the previous government. And despite the fact that we still find ourselves with, with great challenges, um, not the least of which is uh, the fact that we no longer have access to um, an external workforce from, from overseas because of our borders um, having not been open for such a long period of time, and the lack of, I suppose, response to, um, to seeing our borders reopen and the encouragement of, Australia, of uh, people coming to Australia. Uh, we're still waiting for the job summit before that apparently is going to happen. But you know, in government, we invested a um, billion dollars specifically into our rural and regional health sector, um, and including um, making sure through our stronger he uh, rural health strategy uh, that we were encouraging more professionals, more health professionals, to move into rural and regional Australia. Uh, and since we put this in place, um, over 5,000, so in, in the space of five years, over 5,000 GPs, <laughs> nurses, and other allied health workers um, were uh, recruited to work in rural, regional, and remote Australia in support of those people that choose to live outside of our capital cities, and making sure that they have access to appropriate health services. Um, just in this last budget, we uh, added another $300 million to the previous investments. Um, things like making sure that we were getting access to MRIs um, in rural and regional Australia so that people who lived there didn't have to travel to capital cities in order to be able to get this really important treatment that is, uh, is able to be accessed through this particular technology. Um, we also made sure um, that we were continuing to invest heavily in making sure that there were Commonwealth-funded places for uh, medical students training to be GPs. Um, to make sure that uh, in rural and regional locations, because we know that people who train in rural and regional locations are much more likely to stay in those locations uh, and support their communities once they have finished their studies. Um, we established two new university departments of rural health um, at Edith Cowan University and the Goldfields um, at uh, Curtin University uh, in Western Australia. Um, we also invested through um, the Charles Sturt University, through the Rural Clinical School, uh, and we also committed additional funding to the Rural Health Medical Training Program. Um, another thing that we committed to, understanding that the health outcomes in rural and regional Australia are often challenged by the tyranny of distance, was to continue to invest in Australia's favourite, I think, when it comes to um, rural and regional health services, the Royal Flying Doctor Service. Uh, which means that we have over 10 years invested nearly $1 billion in the RFDS, uh, as well as other flight services that have supported so many sick Australians through Care Flight um, and Little Wings. So we stand by our track record um, of supporting rural and regional Australia, but we also understand that rural and regional Australia continues to suffer under some very significant um, pressures for workforce. Um, and some of those have been exacerbated by some of the actions of the incoming government, um, which did not need to happen. Uh, just as an example, one of the first things that the, the Labor government uh, chose to do was to cut almost 70 telehealth services that had been put in place um, to enable access um, by telephone to your GP, uh, recognising at the time they were put in um, that people often either couldn't get to a GP or there was health reasons why they didn't want to interact in the broader community. So a telephone was one of the ways in which they could interact. In removing the telephone consultations without proper reason or rationale or advice, well, if there is it, we haven't seen it, um, we have now excluded um, disproportionately people who live in rural and regional areas. Um, you know, for example, um, you have many people who live in rural and regional areas um, do not have video conferencing opportunities, so they can't video into their doctor. Their telephone line was the lifeline that they had to their health services during COVID, and 70 of these services have been cut, particularly for the most chronically um, uh, people in the most chronic need of health support. Uh, and we um, condemn the decision to do that without proper advice 
Um, but as I said, if there is advice, it's not something that has been um, provided for transparency as to why that decision was made at a time it was made, particularly when we were entering into a new co a wave of the COVID pandemic, when once again Australians were needing the support, protections and measures uh, that the COVID measures had put in place. Um, we also uh, um, would say that one of the great revolutions of the COVID pandemic was telehealth. Um, during the first two years of the pandemic, over 100 million consultations took place over telehealth, absolutely transforming Australia's healthcare system and something that has been disproportionately of benefit to people that live in rural and regional Australia because they often are a very long way away from the services that they would have to uh, access if they had to do so in person. Another issue that um, has been raised significantly around rural and regional um, health uh, has been around the distribution priority area classifications. Previously, this was put in place because we knew uh, of the difficulty of attracting overseas doctors to go to rural and regional areas. So, by putting in place a mechanism that prioritised rural and regional areas for access to this particular workforce, um, we sought to try and encourage more people to go to the regions uh, and, in doing so, ex uh, to alleviate some of the pressure that was on our health system because of a lack of doctors. Um, the decision by this government to expand those um, areas, those uh, DPA areas, um, means that the um, possibly unintended, but certainly a consequence of that, is going to be those outer metropolitan areas and other areas or the larger regional centres that now have got access to, um, to the DPA um, cl and priority classification uh, are likely to be sucking the doctors out of those further out regional and rural communities um, who are least able to be able to um, have those health services um, or those GPs removed from them. So, um, these kind of decisions impact immensely on rural and regional Australia. And another issue that I would put on the record of uh, that I think where this, this government before us has got no regard for what happens in rural and regional Australia is around their urgent care clinics that were supposed to be prioritised into areas that had very low numbers. Um, of GPs uh, and, and access to GPs for, for the people that lived in those communities. During the election campaign, um, one of the areas um, that the, the GPs uh, were uh, the, an urgent care clinic was, um, was uh, nominated to be located was McNamara. Now McNamara is an inner city Melbourne electorate. Not only is it an inner city uh, Melbourne electorate, it actually has the ratio of doctors to patients three times higher than the average in rural and regional Australia. So you would have to question the logic behind the uh, rationale by the, those opposite to support uh, with incentives to get more GPs into areas where there are low numbers of GPs when they're actually prioritising their own marginal electorates from an onslaught from the Greens by actually putting urgent care clinics into an electorate that already has three times the average number of GPs of many of our rural and regional settings. So um, I would say that um, our, the motion before us today, the failure of the government to outline any meaningful plans, um, the only plans that they've outlined so far have had a detrimental effect on rural and regional workforce, particularly um, our GPs. And um, the only things that we have before us are strengthening Medicare. Well, what does that mean? We've got a yes. billion dollars put against it. We have no idea where that billion dollars is going to go. But if our urgent care clinics are any indication of the kind of activities that that one billion dollars is going to be spent on, I wouldn't be holding my breath that it's going to go to be rural and regional Australia. I'd be suggesting we're seeing it spent in metropolitan areas. I hope it's not, and I absolutely plead with those opposite rural, regional Thank and remote you, Australia Senator need your, your help. Your time has expired. Senator Tyrrell. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. This is not my first speech. What it is is my first opportunity to put on record how frustrating I find this. Maybe I'm the only one who is sick of, to the gills of it, but we're spending an hour making speeches about how big a problem the rural GP shortage is. Couldn't we spend an hour actually doing something about it? It's hard to put into words how disconnected this all feels. The Liberals are getting up and saying this problem is all Labor's fault. Labor is getting up and saying it's the Liberals' fault. Does it matter? This isn't about you. The big parties are every problem as the fault of the other side. Nobody ever stands up and says, this is our mess. This is our problem to fix. Everybody here thinks they're cleaners sent in to tidy up after somebody else. 
and the next page. It's painful to watch. When regional communities lose doctors, they don't survive for long. If you're sick and you need a doctor and there isn't one where you are, you leave. You go where you need to go. And if you need to see them again, you leave again. Sooner or later, you move closer to where you need to be. That's when you leave for good. That's what we're seeing in Tasmania. It's happening in Rosebury. It's happening in Ooze. It's even happening in Dover. The song's the same all across Tasmania. Doctors are leaving, and nobody is replacing them. Communities are crying for help. People are flying to the mainland because that's the only way they're going to see someone quickly. What are you supposed to do if you can't afford a return airfare? What if you're too sick to get on a plane in the first place? And all we hear from the major parties is arguments over whose fault it is. The Titanic is sinking. All around you, and you're arguing over who's supposed to be on the lookout for icebergs. We've got a well-meaning policy to attract GPs to rural and regional areas, but it's obviously not working because it doesn't push GPs to work in areas where they're needed the most. And the slack is falling on local councils to pick up. Local councils are paying doctors to work there. They're paying to upgrade medical centres. They're offering free houses to GPs. They're paying for their office equipment, their cars, their fuel, even their phone bills. Not every council can afford to do this. And if you can't afford to complete, compete with the larger councils, if you can't afford to offer the same benefits to GPs, you just don't get a doctor. You go without. And that's not good enough. This is not good enough. How are we supposed to pat ourselves on the back and say, job done, move on, when only wealthy communities can afford a GP? There's a word for that, and that's failure. It's a failure of everyone here on every side of the debate, major party, minor party, independent. Until it's fixed for everyone, it's at the feet of everyone to fix it. I want to start fixing it. I'm open to how we do it. Maybe we can offer full scholarships to young people in areas that need GPs the most, so long as they commit to returning home when they graduate with a medical degree. Maybe we can let pharmacists do more in high-need areas to take some of the burden off existing GPs. Maybe the way we classify the needs of communities has to change. In rural Tassie, about four in five doctors have been trained overseas. When we try to attract new doctors, we're competing with the rest of the world. Maybe the federal government needs to get into our corner and help us win the race for the talent. If you've got ideas, if you want to work with me, my door's open. We can do it quietly. You can even take the credit. I don't care. Senator Lambie doesn't care. Just work with us. My office might be on the other side of the building, but it's not impossible to find. Knock on my door. I'll open it. I want to have a chat. Thank you. Senator O'Sullivan. Thank you very much, Madam Acting Deputy President. I rise to speak on this very important, very important MPI brought before the chamber by Senator Chandler. Uh, from day one, the Albanese Labor government proved that they do not care about regional Australia. They do not care about regional Australia, and they have proven this time and again, and we're only two months in to this government. Let me give you the clearest example of this. Last week, the Albanese Labor government decided to act the Joint Standing Committee on Northern Australia and the Office of Northern Australia. They abandoned Northern Australia on day one of parliament. One of our key, of course, regional areas across Australia is in the north. And they made their view on the importance of rural and regional Australia very clear, and that is that they do not care about rural and regional Australia. And now, by their failure to act, by their failure to outline any meaningful plan to address rural and regional workforce shortages in the health sector, they continue to fail our rural and regional communities. Now, our rural, rural and regional communities face significant challenges and inequalities. There is still a great divide between the city and the country. As my colleague in the other place, the member for Clare, Mr G, said only yesterday, there is a divide in income opportunities and outcomes. And if you live in a country area, your income will not be as high as if you lived in the city. There is a divide in educational opportunities between the city and the country. And there is a divide, of course, in health outcomes. What do we know? The cold, hard 
hard truth is that the further you live away from the city, the younger you will die. The average life expectancy in the country is lower than in the city, and this has been noted by the Australian Institute of Health and Welfare that life expectancy decreases with remoteness. They have also noted that potentially avoidable hospitalisations can be uh, 2.5 times higher in remote areas than in cities. Australians living in remote communities face higher levels of difficulty in accessing medical services, including GPs. And while some of the reasons for this are, of course, outside of the control of health care, uh, the health care sector, access to health services plays an important part. Madam Acting Deputy President, and this is about to get much, much more difficult for our rural and regional Australians. We know that the availability of medical practitioners, particularly GPs in regional, rural and remote locations, has a direct impact on the health outcomes in regional and rural and remote Australia. And this is why we have distribution uh, priority areas, to help identify areas in regional uh, rural, rural and remote communities with unmet needs which are lacking those important access of services by GPs. There are benefits of having DPA status. It ensures that these areas which are lacking access to GP services are looked after by bringing in trained medical practitioners from overseas and participants in the bonded medical uh, program and requiring them to set up in these areas to help reduce that division between the city and the country. The DPA is crucial. It's crucial, crucial to the rural health care system, and it's the backbone of these communities. And now, despite strong opposition from rural doctors, the Albanese Labor government is pushing ahead with their ill-informed plan, as described by the, uh, as, as described indeed by the Rural Doctors Association of Australia, to expand distribution priority areas to inc include peri-urban and outer metro areas. Now, Labor have now expanded DPAs to include large regional centres and outer metro areas. They are taking away from our rural and regional communities, abandoning patients in rural and regional communities who will be left with no access, no access, no access to, uh, the, uh, to services that are close to their homes. No access at all. Uh, they're taking from Peter to pay Paul, robbing Peter to pay Paul. That's how the Royal Australian College of General Practitioners described it, because they know that there is an extreme risk that rural and regional communities will lose doctors as they take up positions that are closer to the cities. I mean, you can't blame them, really, if you're not providing those incentives and that direct support that is available to ensure that we're attracting good doctors in these remote and regional settings. Uh, this is an unintended and unwanted consequence of this of this ill-informed decision made by an Albanese Labor government that, that, despite what they've been told by those working in our rural and regional health care sector, they're persisting with this policy. What they should be doing is looking to encourage more of our medical students and our future doctors to choose general practice as their career, whether this is through cutting red tape, making it easier and more attractive uh, career pathways for our students, whether it uh, whatever it is, solving the GP shortage in rural and regional uh, Australia uh, will not happen by taking away from our rural and regional communities. Now, in the brief time that I have remaining in this MPI, I just want to give a shout out to the More Than Mining campaign. Now, this is a particular program that is uh, or initiative that's been driven primarily by the mining industry communities or communities that have resource sector uh, jobs. Uh, that are close by, they're, they're advocating for uh, a, a change to how we treat the fringe benefit tax. Uh, now, one of the big issues in attracting staff in these areas uh, is, is housing and access to affordable housing, uh, particularly housing uh, in a market that's uh, cyclical because of the boom and bust cycle. And I just, in this moment here, the remaining time on MPI, the 30 seconds that I've got left. I just want to give a shout out to those that have been advocating for this program. I remain committed to this. I think it's something that they've got some innovative ideas, whether it's precisely the solution that they've come up with or quite possibly a variation of that. I think it's something that uh, we should look closely at in enabling people that are choosing to put their roots down in, in regional communities to be able to get tax 
uh, benefit in choosing to purchase homes and rent homes in these places, to increase the, the, the pool of homes that are available, to increase the stock that's available, could be a good way of actually attracting staff into these areas. And I want to commend the More Than Mining campaign and the communities that have been supporting it. Thank you, Senator O'Sullivan. Senator Hanson. Thank you very much. I thank Senator Chandler for bringing this matter to the attention of the Senate, although I am compelled to point out that the shortage of general practitioners in rural and regional Australia is a problem the Coalition failed to address during the nine years it was in power. This crisis is not only risking the health and wellbeing of Australians who live in rural and regional areas, it is costing taxpayers and the economy a great deal of money. In June this year, the Courier Mail newspaper revealed Queensland taxpayers were funding pay packages of up to $1 million a year each to fly in locum doctors to plug gaps in health services delivery across the state. They have been recruited in desperation, with regional hospitals in Queensland sometimes being forced to turn patients away for the lack of a doctor. Rural generalists have been offered $2,700 per day to work in Wide Bay. Radiologists have been offered up to $4,000 per day to work at locums on the Sunshine Coast. The total outlay for these fly-in locums was $118 million last year, and this cost is rising. $34 million was spent by the Queensland Government on locums in the first quarter of this year, and it's not working. When you're sick, you have the right to see a doctor there and then, not after you've recovered. But waiting times for GP appointments in regional Queensland have blown out to months. People are travelling long distances in order to see a doctor more quickly. The town of Mara in Queens, central Queensland hasn't had a permanent GP since December and went without a doctor for more than a week back in March. Local residents were forced to resort to telehealth appointments or else drive 65 kilometres to Biloela to see a doctor. It's no wonder doctors are leaving regional areas. The workload is horrendous and many are burnt out or exhausted. And it's not just doctors. There are shortages of a wide range of health practitioners, nurses, midwives, pharmacists, dentists, optometrists, psychologists and occupational therapists are all in short supply. Then there's aged and palliative care. The lack of these services in regional Queensland is appalling. There is not a single hospice in Queensland located north of the Sunshine Coast. This is why I fought tooth and nail for $8 million to build the Fitzroy Community Hospice in Rockhampton, and I hope the Albanese government doesn't cut out that funding. Why we must do more to encourage and incentivise Australians to study medicine and to practice in the country. Importing doctors is not the solution. Up to 12,000 foreign doctors are in Australia and, and have applied to work here but cannot pass the standards required, and many cannot even speak English, which risks misdiagnosis and adverse medical outcomes if they are to ever be allowed to work here. It's also worth noting here the impact of COVID-19 vaccine mandates. Many are not allowed to treat patients because they have not taken the wonder jab. It isn't it amazing that bureaucrats think they know more than doctors about the safety and efficiency of the wonder jab? This all adds up to a potential disaster in the making. On average, Australians living in rural and regional areas have lower life expectancy and experience higher levels of disease and injury compared to people living in our cities. Rural and regional Australia should be prioritised, not neglected. One Nation has been calling for practical solutions to be implemented, such as tightening the obligations on medical graduates under the bonded medical program. At the moment, graduates have 18 years to complete an obligatory three years of practice in a regional area in exchange for a Commonwealth-supported place in a medical course. It should be reduced to seven years. And the government needs to consider ways to recover taxpayers' contribution to graduate studies is there, um, they don't, don't meet the original obligation. Australian, all Australians should be able to afford and access quality medical care regardless of where they live. The taxpayers have funded this and there was a scheme put out, and these, these students have taken up. They said, yes, we will go and work in rural and regional areas. They have given 18 years to do that, and they haven't taken it up. Only 500 have actually done it. 
out of, out of thousands. Why are we funding these students? Why hasn't the government chased it up and says, well, you made an obligation, the taxpayers have funded you now, why haven't you done your duty? I'm calling on this government now to look at that obligation, reduce it to seven years, make sure that doctors are actually given the jobs in rural and regional areas to look after all Australians as well. Thank Bye -bye. you. Before I call Senator Pratt, Senator Thorpe, I'll ask you to stop yelling across the chamber. Oh, Senator Thorpe! Senator Thorpe! I have asked you. I have asked you to stop yelling across the chamber. Senator Thorpe, please respect the the um, request of the chair. Senator Pratt. Well, when I read the MPI this morning and its topic, I was completely astonished. For a representative of a party that, while in power, dismantled and starved our rural and regional health workforce and funding and employment opportunities, to bring on an MPI on this topic, to my mind, was extraordinary. And I'm, I'll go into the detail and unpack that. Perhaps, perhaps you were. Um, uh, you know, taking more uh, credit in, you know, looking at your own policies in a blinkered way without really seeing what was going on. We saw years of neglect, years of, neglect uh, of our Medicare system by the coalition. In my own home state of WA, uh, if you look at rural and regional Western Australia per head of population, the spending on Medicare per head of population is proportionately so much lower than anyone in a metropolitan area. People do not have access in rural and regional Western Australia to the health professionals uh, such as doctors and specialists uh, that they uh, should be able to go and see. Uh, and so the lack of access to health professions uh, is actually very much reflected in the per head spending uh, on, uh, on Medicare around regional WA when compared to the Perth metropolitan area. So I wonder really what's going on in the heads of those opposite. While in your time in government you ripped billions of dollars out of primary care and caused gap skis to rocket, We'll, and so we will clean Senator up Sullivan. that mess left by the Liberal Party. But this is not going to be easy. The last government arbitrarily axed the ability of a long list of communities to recruit overseas trained doctors, to fill gaps in general practice, as well as those in outer suburbs and in the regions. There's a dire need not only in regional WA uh, but also in Perth communities. Uh, in Western Australia uh, last year, a well-known paediatrician died, a paediatrician who had a high caseload. As a result of that, the waiting list to get in to see a paediatrician blew out for everyone by more than a year. It wouldn't matter if you were a high needs family or child or not. You could not get in to see a paediatrician for more than a year. This is the legacy of the historical underfunding of Senator, our medical centre. Senator uh, Pratt, can you resume your seat for a moment? Senator O'Sullivan, I've asked you already once to stop interjecting. Interjections are disorderly. Please stop interjecting. Senator Pratt. So the Labor Party initiated the Senate inquiry into GP shortages in the last parliament. We heard mountains and mountains of evidence from people not being able to see a GP at all, about having to wait many months for an appointment, having to travel hours when they finally do get to see one. This is why Labor has deliberately not changed the regional incentive payments that doctors receive for working in remote Australia. It's why we recognise the importance of providing additional incentives for doctors to work in those remote and regional communities. So I find this extraordinary uh, that 
Senator Chandler, now that she's lost the power of being in government on these issues, suddenly appears interested in these issues. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. The government funds a range of programs and incentives to encourage GPs to relocate and work there, in addition to the distribution priority area program. So while we've got this architecture, we know uh, that it, we have to prioritise improving it. We have uh, got our Strengthening Medicare Task Force now. This task force met last Friday and it's tasked with finding the best ways to boost affordability, improve access and deliver better support for patients, especially for patients with ongoing and chronic illnesses. And this work, their work and their findings, will be backed by the $750 million Strengthening Medicare Fund. We know that our health professionals have worked tirelessly throughout the pandemic. They are working tirelessly now. You know, I've got two aged parents, uh, one of whom with significant health conditions, who are at home in quarantine uh, as they recently tested positive with COVID. But they have uh, a good GP that's checking in on them, and they've also got the resourcing of the state government. We know it's critically important that we resource our doctors to look after Australians, to provide them the care that they need. This is in particular why uh, we are uh, investing some $220 million in GP practices uh, around Australia. This will be incredibly important to rural and regional Australia. We also have a plan to invest $146 million to attract and retain health workers to rural and regional Australia. This includes the improving training and incentive uh, programs and supporting the development of innovative models of multidisciplinary care. We're going to boost workforce incentives for rural and regional GPs to support the engagement of nurses, allied health and other health professionals and provide multidisciplinary team-based care, also critically important. We're also going to expand uh, the innovative models of collaborative care program across rural and regional Australia because we know that the support to retain our rural health professionals is absolutely critical. There are so many practical steps that governments can and should do to support the rural and regional workforce here in Australia. Uh, this includes, for example, a constituent case that came recently through my office where you find the only psychiatrist, the only psychiatrist in the Pilbara of Western Australia that's there to service uh, that is qualified to meet the needs of children, uh, can't stay in Australia because she has a child with autism. Clearly the state government is now making appeals to uh, the Commonwealth government to say these are the kinds of issues that we need to fix. And I know, sitting on the government benches, that these are indeed the kinds of issues that we need to fix, that your government was absolutely missing in action on on a day-to-day -day basis. We're here also to expand the John Flynn pre-vocational doctor program to more than 1,000 placements in rural and regional Australia per year, strengthen rural generalist and GP registrar training, as well as uh, providing Australians access to universal, prompt, world-class medical care. Something that has been ignored by those opposite for too long. We want to see our rural and regional communities right around Australia get the access that they deserve. Access, like I said, to universal, to prompt, world-class medical care. 
No one in our nation deserves to face a multi-year wait for vital treatments simply due to where they live. And whilst uh, I can see that those opposite recognise these issues now that they're in opposition, I'm very pleased to stand up here and debate them on it, because you were silent for eight years on, uh, on all of these issues. Not once did I come in here and see you prioritise these needs. Instead, we got the uh, glib all announcement and no end of no delivery. The proof will be in the pudding. We are early in our term and we know we have to get on and implement these measures, whereas those opposite were all announcement and no delivery year after year. We are here with a commitment in the Labor Party to building our public health care system right across remote and regional Australia. Senator Pratt, your time has expired. Senator Davey. Thank you very much. Um, I just want to acknowledge I, I have actually heard some very good news from Senator Pratt in, in her contribution. Um, what I heard is, and I am very relieved to hear, that the new government will be continuing the former coalition government's model of multidisciplinary care team care ba uh, team based care, which I had the pleasure of announcing the pilot for under the former regional health care minister Mark Coulton. Um, so I'm I'm very pleased that our coalition government policy will be continued. I'm also pleased to hear that the regional training programs will be continued, that our government's uh, Murray-Darling Basin Medical School that recognises that if you train in the regions, you're more likely to work and stay in the regions, and um, the continuation of our rural generalist pathways. I hope that includes the rural um, generalist pathways for uh, registered nurses and allied health professionals as well. What I didn't hear was whether they are going to continue the, um, what we termed in the pilot Murrumbidgee single employer model that uh, improves the working conditions and the contractual arrangements for uh, GPs who move to regional areas, which was something that our government implemented. Um, what I didn't hear from Senator Pratt, however, is how the new government's changes to the distribution priority areas is going to help us achieve increase in rural and regional health workforce. How can the new government look people in the eye and say that a doctor, an overseas trained doctor, should get the same incentives and benefits if they're going to work in Newcastle? as they do if they're going to work in a GP clinic in Cessnock or in Scone? How can they say that putting these uh, hard-fought-for overseas-trained doctors or bonded Australian uh, medical places in Western Sydney compared to Broken Hill or Burke? It doesn't stack up. There are already significant inequalities that, yes, our government was in place for nine years and, yes, we put the hard yards in because there is no silver bullet on this issue. We acknowledge there is no silver bullet, but we worked very hard talking to the Rural Doctors Association, the um, Royal College of General Practitioners, the allied health professionals. How can we address this issue? How can we get, train more? in the regions, retain more in the regions. Um, but this one policy announcement by the new government has the Rural Doctors Association of Australia now warning that they are fearful, and I quote, fearful for rural communities right across Australia who are now at extreme risk of losing their doctors 
as they take up positions closer to the cities, abandoning their rural and remote patients who will be left with no access to care close at home. They went further and made a harrowing call that Labor's policies will cost the lives of rural and remote patients who already suffer poorer health outcomes than their city counterparts. I just this afternoon had a meeting with uh, council representatives from far north Queensland, and they told the story of how in their small community um, they have a doctor, they have a district nurse, and they have a policeman. But if there is a trauma, a road trauma or an accident overnight, due to workplace fatigue management, which is a very serious issue in regional areas, there is a snowball effect. Now, they would love to have extra workforce, but how can they compete if we're saying the distribution priority areas can have someone in Townsville rather than in remote far north Queensland? The Australian Institute of Health and Welfare has noted that these hospitalisations in rural areas can be avoided by getting more GPs out there. The Labor Party's you, policy Senator will Davey, not do your that. Time has expired. The time for the discussion has expired. I shall now proceed.